My goodness, I appreciate that. And what a special opportunity for me as a pastor in that regard. And to just love, love that couple and that little one. He was scowling the other day. When he came in, he was scowling. And we decided he got that from Clarence. Because <laughs> Miss Brittany almost always has a smile. I think that I can remember has a smile on her face. And uh, so we're glad for that. Well, if you have your Bibles, if you would, open the book of Colossians tonight. Thanks for being here. Thanks for coming to the service. Hope you had a great day with, with your family and loved ones close to you. As we look now at Colossians, we continue in our series on the, the book of Colossians and specifically Jesus Christ. Book of Colossians, the central three theme of it, I believe, is the exaltation and the central idea of Jesus Christ. We're going to find that specifically tonight as we kind of find our passage that I have looked at and that I would submit would be kind of the key passage for the entire book. The, the book would be built around, I believe, kind of this passage right here. I find that in Colossians, Paul was dealing with some concepts, some ideas that had snuck into the church there, some false ideas, some false doctrine. And Paul dealt with that, and he'll deal with that um, a little later on in the book. But what he does is a great challenge to you and to me and a great reminder to any church and any Christian. He begins by pointing the Christians and pointing this young church right back to Jesus Christ. You can't go wrong when you put your eyes back on Jesus Christ. In fact, you will go wrong when you look anywhere else. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus said this in Revelation, I am the Alpha and the Omega. And in case you don't know Greek, he goes on in your Bible to say the beginning and the end. When it started, when it ends, it's all about Jesus Christ. And our eyes must be on him. Our life must be focused around Jesus Christ, but our lives get focused around so many other things. Jobs creep in. Jobs that take hours and hours of our time, and we find ourselves thinking about that and working our life away, and Jesus Christ seems to take a second role to our job, and it shouldn't be a competition. You know that, that men, when, when God created us, he created us to work. Our work glorifies Jesus Christ. But the minute that we think our work is more important than Jesus Christ. We have now undermined what Jesus Christ has done in that. Work is not more important than Jesus, but it's not, it's not supposed to be a competition with Jesus either. Work can really get in the way of Jesus Christ. Kids can get in the way of Jesus Christ. Isn't that interesting how, how blessings of life, how blessings of life can steal away our relationship with God? We will all of a sudden focus on the children. We'll think about them more than we will about Jesus Christ. The centrality, the central idea of Jesus Christ. Look in Colossians 1, please, beginning in verse number 15 tonight. So we come into this passage, which I believe would submit as the key to Colossians. Where the Bible says, speaking of Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Jesus Christ created all things. We'll look at that in just a moment. But understand, by him, created by Jesus Christ, and for Jesus Christ. You and I were created not for ourselves, not to live our own lives. We were created for Jesus Christ. That means he made you just the way he wanted to make you. Created by him, and what he has called you to is good because it's for him. Well, I don't like the way I was made. I'm sorry. I wish I was faster. I wish I was taller. I wish I was shorter. I wish I was skinnier. I wish I was smaller. I wish I was more talented. And the list goes on and on and on and on, does it not? 
I want to change this and change that. And then Christ calls us to something, and we're not content with that either. Say, but Lord, I want that job over there. I want that house. I want those blessings. I want that family. I want that life situation. All things were created by him and for him. And the way he made you, the life he has called you to is good because it's for him. You say, well, pastor, I just don't see how it's good. And maybe I won't either. And maybe you and I won't until we have the understanding of Jesus Christ when we get to heaven and our minds will be fully open. And then we'll see his plan. Then we'll see his working. I've been reading in the book of Job. And I'm again humbled by the fact that God called Job to such a trial of hardship and and turmoil in his life, losing his children, losing his health, losing his riches, and the health and riches pale in comparison to the grief of, of the children that he lost. And we would begin the book and just see that the hand of God and, and pointing out Job to Satan and I believe to the other demonic forces and saying, this is what a committed follower of God looks like. And Satan arguing with God, I don't think so. And God says, I will show you, test him. And God allows Job to be tested. And then throughout the book, as I've read the, the three friends, the three friends who, who falsely accused Job and falsely accused God. I got to the last chapter, I believe it's chapter 42, where God now comes to the friends and says, listen, you won't be right with me unless Job prays for you. You're in trouble. So go back to Job. He's got to pray for you. And, and they take some sacrifice back to Job. What struck me is that I remembered another story where God told someone, listen, you're not going to be accepted with me unless you change what you're doing. And that man's name was Cain. Remember that? God came to Cain and and God said, Cain, you're not accepted by me. Change what you're doing. Change the way you're worshiping. And then I will accept what you're doing. And and I saw the humility of, of these three friends who went back to Job, but I saw the kindness of Job. If that was you, if that was me sitting there in complete turmoil, life turned upside down, and hearing those friends, those close friends, ones who sat with you, who wept with you, then falsely accusing you and finding out you have the key to their happiness and their acceptance with God, would you pray for them? I just may wait a day. I may wait an afternoon. I may just let them have a little bit of what I've experienced, but he didn't do that, did he? Job prayed for him. Humility of Job, the kindness of Job. What God does is good because all things were made by him and for him. Continue on in the passage. Verse 17, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That in all things, here it is, he might have the preeminence. This passage, verses 15, 16, 17, and 18, I believe described to us, build the foundation for why Jesus Christ must be the first priority. Someone said it this way, that typically our problem is a Jesus problem. Typically our problem is a Jesus problem. When someone drops out of church, they have a problem with Jesus. They may point it at someone else. They may say, well, that pastor, that member, that situation. But ultimately, they have a Jesus problem. Someone drops out of their marriage. When they drop out, they have a Jesus problem. When someone doesn't live a life that pleases God, they have a Jesus problem. When they've left the Bible out of their life, they've left prayer out of their life, ultimately, it's a Jesus problem. So tonight... Let's look at making Jesus Christ, again, preeminent in your life, in my life. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Lord, I pray these next few moments that you would guide me. Help me, Lord, to say those things that are true. Lord, I've tried to do my part and study this passage. Lord, no way could I even scratch the surface of your truth here, the depth of it. But Lord, your spirit can bear witness. It can touch our hearts. 
Lord, I pray that if there are those here tonight who are struggling with the place of Jesus in their life, well, they may not even realize it yet. Lord, I pray that you would touch us. Lord, that you would help us put you right back on the throne in our heart and our life. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. I wonder if tonight, if you have a Jesus problem. You say, well, how can I have a Jesus problem? Here I am on a Sunday night sitting in church listening to you, Pastor Howell. You can sit in church every service that we have here at First Baptist Church. You can sit in church on the days we don't have services here at First Baptist Church and still have a problem with Jesus Christ in your life. You say, Pastor, how can I have a problem with Jesus? Listen, I carry the biggest Bible known to man into every service at First Baptist Church. You can carry the biggest Bible, you get it on your phone, and still have a problem with Jesus Christ having the top priority in your life. I think one of the greatest, greatest um, temptations of the devil is not that you replace and ignore Jesus, you just move him. You just move him a little bit to the side, just a little bit. He's still important. He just may be as important as my family, as my job, as this bill. He may be important, and I'm not going to reject him. I would never deny him. I would never be a Peter, of course. I wouldn't do that. No, no, no. But, but you know what? It, it, when he fits in, fine. When it doesn't fit in to what's going on in my life, fine. And so when I'm really irritated, Jesus Christ gets set aside. Because I need to respond right now and react right now, and then I'll bring him back in and put a smile on my face. When there's a big problem and I've got a bill due, well, I could work overtime or I could really look to Jesus. I'll just do this and then we'll pray along the way. He's as important or just moved aside just a little bit. That in all things the Bible says, he, that is Jesus Christ, in your life and in my life, and everything we do, say, think, choose, that he has the first place. Scripture gives us three places here in this passage. The first one is this, preeminence in creation. Preeminence in creation. We see that in verses 15, 16, and 17. Genesis 1, 1, the Bible opens up for all of us the same way. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We find that in the first page of our Bible. And this is no contradiction to Genesis chapter 1, because this clearly says that Jesus Christ is the one who actually performed the creation. Jesus is God. There is no contradiction. In fact, I think it fits in just a wonderful, a wonderful connection. You read Genesis chapter 1, you'll find out how God made the world. He made it by speaking. He said things like this, let there be. And the Bible goes on to say, there was. Anything that God says happens. It happens. And God said, let there be, let there be, let there be, and it became it was it was it was and it was good but the bible tells us that jesus christ is the word of god god created the heavens and the earth and he spoke jesus is the word that's john chapter one in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god the same was in the beginning with god remember beginning from genesis chapter one and then in John chapter 1, the same thing is said as in Colossians chapter number 1, where John chapter 1 says, all things were made by him, and without him, that is Jesus, was not anything made that was made. Listen, my friend, Jesus Christ created the heavens and the earth. Everything that you and I see, Jesus Christ created. He is the creator. Don't allow the thought process to come in that this just happened. But it's more damaging than that. Because Jesus Christ is a creator, creation establishes a few things. First of all, creation establishes authority. Because Jesus Christ created everything, he has the authority over everything. If you made something, it is yours. If you write a song, we have what's called copyright laws. And you can stop someone from using your 
creation, your song. You could write a poem. Same thing, you could write a book. A creation establishes authority as creator. He is in charge. Now listen, unsaved does not want the authority of Jesus Christ in their life. They don't want the authority that Jesus Christ brings as the creator. Because he's a creator, he can set up exactly the way he wants it to operate. But sometimes neither do Christians. Sometimes neither do Christians. Well, I don't like the fact that Jesus made the man first. You can like it or not like it, but that's what he did. Well, do you think men are more important than women? I do not think that. The Bible never teaches that one single page, one single word. Men and women created equally in worth, different in roles. Mentioned men this morning, the ladies in the, in, the, in the Mother's Day brunch down there, that as I went around the tables, I told many ladies, everyone that I saw, kind of came in contact with, I said to these, these words, Happy Mother's Day. Some ladies are so conditioned, as we all are, the response was, you too. <laughs> Thank you. You made it awkward for me, but hey, <laughs> enjoy being a mother. Understand in creation, there's a role that I have that's not going to be a be a mother. I can like it or not like it, doesn't matter though, does it, folks? Help me here. I'm not going to be a mommy. All right, that doesn't make me angry. It's just me understanding as a creator, he set things up in a certain way. He has authority. He's allowed to do that because it's his creation. And Christians will fight this idea. Christians will fight it and say, no, I don't think that's right. I think this is right. You can think what you want, but Jesus Christ establishes authority because he's, he's the creator. It, it, it establishes knowledge as creator. He knows. He knows you. He knows me. He knows what will bring you happiness and joy and peace in your life. He knows because he's a creator. And then he goes on in his goodness and love to tell you and to tell me what will do that. He says things like this, the fruit of the Spirit. So allowing the Holy Spirit as a Christian to prosper in your life and in my life will bring love and joy and peace. It'll bring those things. As a creator, he has knowledge, and he says, listen, this is a way to find those things you're looking for. What do we do as Christians sometimes? Well, you know what? I'll find love, but I'll find it apart from the Holy Spirit and God's way. And you will find like, and you will find lust, but you will not find true love. True love is found here in God because God is love. He is. Inherently, he is love. You will look for peace, and you will look for happiness. You will find some flashes of enjoyment apart from God. People do it every single day with money. Every single day they're looking to find happiness with money. You know what they say when they get at the end of the day? What do they say? It's not there. It's not there. Now listen, I'm not against money and neither is the Lord. He's against the love of money. But not against money. I mean, you think about Abraham. Abraham was richly blessed. Job, richly blessed. Richly blessed. But it's just inside of his knowledge. Creation establishes authority. Creation establishes knowledge. There is not one square inch of this entire universe about which Jesus does not speak out. This is mine. This belongs to me. And by him, all things consist, or all things are held together. Without Jesus Christ, you would literally go to nothing. He made this world from nothing, and without his power, it would go back to nothing. The reason God came from nowhere was that there was nowhere to, for him to come from. The reason that, Jesus, that God stood on nothing was because there was nothing for him to stand on. The reason he reached out of nowhere and caught something when there was nothing to catch and hung something on nothing and told to stay there 
and nobody said anything about it was because there was no one there but him. Jesus Christ, he's preeminent because of creation. The scripture goes beyond that in this passage if you continue on in verse number 18. It builds on that concept and Paul says this to the church and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence. I see preeminence in creation and then I see preeminence in the church. Paul brings the church of Colossae back right to Jesus Christ. He says, listen, this church here is not about you. It's not about a social gathering. It's not about maybe the pastor or Epaphras who is leading the church here. It's not about this member or this member. It's about Jesus Christ. My friend, when you come to church, it's about Jesus Christ. There's going to be some people who sing and take the offering and lead in prayer and play the offertory and serve in the nursery, and that's wonderful. But listen, I'm not more important than you. You're not more important than me. We may have different roles at church. Now, I know that some of you women want this role right here. I get it. I get it. You have a few things you have to say. If I could, I'd let you. I really would. I'd sit around and bring some popcorn. I, I can't do. Yikes. We may have different roles at church, but it's not about me. This is not my church. It's his church. I'm trying to please him, and I'm trying to encourage us as a church to please him as well. We're not trying to build this kingdom. We're trying to build his kingdom. He is the head of the body of the church. We come to church. The reason we try to do what we do is because of Jesus Christ. I want him to be worshipped. As I try to make decisions and lead the church, I'm called upon to lead the church in an earthly sense. I'm trying to make decisions that will point us right back to Jesus Christ. I've tried to have some intentional decisions. Why we structure the service a certain way. I intentional. We're not going to bat a thousand. We may not even bat 500. But we're going to do our best to bat for Jesus Christ. When you come to church, we're coming because of Jesus Christ. So we go witnessing. Guess who it's for? Help me here. I'll try one more time. I know. I didn't know. Until when we go witnessing, who, who are we going for? So if we don't, who are we not going witnessing for? Not for me as a pastor. Not for me. Mm -mm. If you do or go or don't go, it's not for me. It's for him. It's for him. How about this? When you sing in the choir, who do you sing for, choir? Jesus Christ. Right? Not for me as a, as a current choir director. I'll be coming gone soon, right? But for Jesus Christ. As you work in the nursery, ladies and men this morning, thank you. As you work in the nursery, who do you work in the nursery for? Well, those moms, those little children. Now, you should love the little children. We are blessed with, with great, great nursery workers. I think of the Jaspersons who are back now from California. You pray for them. They're probably on tonight, and we, we love the Jaspersons so much. Worked for years in our nurseries. Influenced countless Young people, countless young people. So thankful for that. But you know who they're serving? They're not serving the pastor or the church or the, even the children. Who are they serving? Jesus Christ. Don't miss what we do. All this is supposed to be all about Jesus Christ. I saw once that someone had switched their, their church service and they called it the show, the Sunday show. This isn't supposed to be a show. Now, we're going to use things that people use in shows like lights and sound equipment. You know why? Because I hope that it helps the service go forward. I just kind of think it's better if you can see me. Well, maybe not, sorry. If you can see rather than not see. Do you think it's better if you can hear rather than not hear for the service? But folks, this isn't supposed to be a show. It's not supposed to be a show. It's about worshiping Jesus Christ. Christ, the scripture says here, he led the church. The scripture here says he is the firstborn from the dead. Now understand something in this, in this unique construction of these words here. Jesus Christ was not the first person ever raised from the dead. God raised up Jesus from the dead after three days in the ground. All right? But he was not the first one ever raised. In fact, Jesus himself had raised Lazarus from the dead. And back in the Old Testament, there are those children who were raised back to life. 
Others, and I know, I'm sure there was more than we ever know about, that God raised up from the dead. And so the Scripture did not make a mistake here. Well, Jesus wasn't the first one. No, it is telling us that Jesus Christ, in this regard, in this construction, is the highest rank. He has the chief position and maintains the highest position over all those who are, have been, and will be raised from the dead. He was not the first, and he won't be the last. One day he's coming back to take us home to be with him. And the Bible says those which are dead in Christ, uh, they, or the dead in Christ, shall rise first. They will be raised up again. Jesus Christ has the highest ranking of all those raised from the dead. He's first priority. <laughs> he leads the church. He's the boss. There was a motto on a wall in a church in Kansas City. Wake up, sing up, preach up, pray up, pay up, stay up, never give up or let up or back up or shut up until the cause of Christ in this church and the world is built up. That was pretty good, I thought. Someone, or this idea, the world is a creation of Jesus Christ, right? But the church is the new creation of Jesus Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Last night, he's preeminent in, in creation in the church, but he ought to be preeminent in the Christian. That in all things, verse 18, he might have the preeminence. First in position, first in purpose, first in plans, so that I can say truly before the Lord, Christ, you are first in my life. We have a little phrase that in church things, look at it, verse number 18. That in church things, look at that last phrase. He might have the preeminence. Is that what it says? It doesn't say church things, does it? That in family things, that in financial things, that in big health issues, that in all things. All things. Christian, that can be tough. We're happy if we have some things. We're really happy and we feel pretty good if the words in our mind were to say most things. But Jesus Christ is only happy when in our life, in your life, and in my life, the words are all things. Tonight, the challenge for you and for me is to make sure that you and I don't have a Jesus problem. Lord, you have most of my life, not good enough. Lord, you have some of my life, not good enough. Lord, you have everything but one thing, not good enough. That in all things, when I wake up, I think, Jesus Christ, this is your day. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. But pastor, it's Monday. Praise the Lord for Mondays. Praise the Lord for Mondays and for Tuesdays and for Wednesdays. Praise the Lord you can identify Monday. Praise the Lord when the sun's shining. Praise the Lord when the sun's covered by clouds. Leonardo da Vinci, the great artist, was painting one of his masterpieces known now as The Last Supper. It took him three years to complete this work of art. Three years. As he was painting it, toward the end, he admitted a few friends to come and see the art, this picture, the Last Supper. If you're familiar with the picture, Jesus Christ is at a table here and the disciples are around him. One of them said this, what a wonderful cup. When Leonardo da Vinci first painted the picture of the Last Supper, the cup that Jesus Christ had was beautiful and ornate. They said it was crusted with jewels. Truly an epic part of the painting. In fact, this person said, one of his friends said, such a wonderful cup, 
Such a cup has never been painted before. And as the story goes, which I verified multiple times, though I was not there, they said that Leonardo da Vinci immediately walked over with a paintbrush and splashed dark paint on the cup. And said this, or along these lines, the glory of Christ and not the beauty of the cup must be the central object of this work. And in all things, he might be preeminent, not this vessel. Many of us, when Christ has enabled us to overcome one or two sins that were an obvious nuisance, we're inclined to feel that we're now good enough. Lord, you help me with this and you help me overcome this. That, we, that he has done all that he has wanted to do that, and that he would be obliged to leave us alone. Imagine that you're living in a house. And Jesus Christ comes in to rebuild that house. And at first you understand what he's doing. He, he stops the drains from leaking. He enables the windows to shut and open properly. You knew that those jobs needed to be done in this house, and you're not surprised that, that Jesus did those jobs. But you become very surprised when he knocks out the back wall, when he writs out the side wall, when he begins to build a second story. Because when Jesus Christ becomes preeminent, he begins to build something in you and in I. And I don't want to be content with the small shack. Jesus Christ is building a palace. He's building a place in your life and in my life that is worthy of him to live. That in all things, he might have the preeminence. Do you have a Jesus problem? Most things? Lord, you're first place in some things, most things, almost all things, and in all things, every part of my life, he is number one. Amen. Lord, I pray you'd help us tonight. You truly are a loving Savior, wonderful Creator. Lord, I pray tonight that you would Convict us where we need convicting. Lord, that your truth would be challenging to our current status. We would not be content to have most of you in us. But Lord, that we'd only be content to have all of you in all of us. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be honest, to respond the right way. And friend, Simple question. Do you have a Jesus problem? If you do, in a moment we'll stand and I encourage you to spend time with him. Maybe he has most of you, but not all of you. Give them all. Maybe you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. We'd love to open a Bible and introduce you to Jesus Christ. That in all things, that in all things, that in everything we do, work, home, finances, decisions, he might have the preeminence. Anything less is a Jesus problem. Lord, bless this invitation now. In Jesus' name, I ask, amen. As you stand to your feet and heads bowed and eyes closed, piano's already playing. God's touched your heart. Do you respond the way you're supposed to tonight? song the pianist is playing, I'll live for Jesus day after day. I'll live for Jesus, let come what may.
the Holy Spirit, I will obey. I'll live for Jesus day after day. Would you sing that with me? I'll live for Jesus day after day. I'll live for Jesus. Let come what may, the Holy Spirit, I will obey and live for Jesus day after day. One more time now. I'll live for Jesus day after day. I'll live for Jesus. Let come what may, the Holy Spirit, I will obey. I'll live for Jesus day after day. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your mercy and grace and compassion. Lord, thank you that you are so kind to us. Lord, as we fail, you're merciful and gracious to us. Lord, thank you that you've promised that when you've begun a good work in us, this work of this house, Lord, you won't complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And you're faithful to that. Lord, may we live for you day after day. In Jesus' name I ask, amen.